started. Welcome to another Stoke session with the Magnetic team. Today we've got Dave Kornick, founder and global head of strategy. Yep. We've got Brad Hendrickson, the chief revenue officer here at MAG. Uh, today we're going to be talking about a few different topics, uh, mainly focused around CPG, um, consumer packaged goods and consumer goods, which is a huge focus for us here at MAG. Uh, I'm really excited to get into it. We've got a few fun little uh, topics to cover today with both the guys. I'm super excited to have them here. So kick us off. Uh, Dave, you and I have known each other for a super long time. Uh, mm. I think we're coming up on like 25-ish years that we've known each other. Uh, Brother from another mother, man. I yeah. know, right? Uh, been super fun. We started working professionally about 20 years ago together, uh, mm. which has been super cool. And um, one of the things that I always appreciate you is just the amount of inspiration you can fill a room with. Um, your storytelling is, uh, you know, second to none. And it's been really cool to be, a, be able to be part of those stories with you over the last 20 years. Um, but one of the things that I always, one of the stories that I always love hearing from you um, that's just like timeless is the story of uh, Vizio TVs and kind of the impact that um you know, the design talents and the, and the brand talents that we've fostered over the years, uh, how big of an impact that's had on the consumer goods market. Um, mm. So I was hoping you could share that story with us and just kind of kick us off there. Man. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, yeah. Just kind of going back, that was kind of where we got our start really. Right. Um, met William and team back in the gateway days when they were doing basically TVs for gateway. Uh, and then gateway decided to go back to just computers. And William says, well, I want to do my own brand. And then here came Vizio, right? So worked with them to develop and build out this brand. And one of the, I think the biggest like kind of pushes for us was we got to deal with Costco. And at the time, Costco was all about um, brown boxes in store. I mean, if you're, if you're old enough like me to remember what Costco <laughs> used to look like, um, it was you walked into a bunch of rack. It's a wholesale distributor of product at large amounts. And these big brown boxes were all over the shelves. And we walked in and I just said, look, I think we have a huge opportunity here to make these boxes become our billboards and really change the way that big box retail positions are packaging. And William's like, let's do it. And so we built this brand out. Um, you know, we kind of went to these white boxes with these cool orange swirls on them, the, the Vizio logo that we had done. And, and we put them out there with all these brown boxes. And it was the funniest thing ever watching people walk up to the box, look around, look at the TV, look at the prices, look at the white box, and then just put it in their cart. And sales went ballistic. It went crazy. I remember CES that year, all of the retailers were saying, you need to do what Vizio has done. And the funny thing was, is we had always anticipated that that would happen. And so the first thing we did, I said, if this works, William, if the white box works, we're going to go to a full color billboard box and we'll be like everywhere plastered with free advertising in the store. And that's basically what happened. The white box killed it. Sales went crazy. We replaced them with, while everybody else was just catching up to the white box, we launched these full color boxes. And at the time, there wasn't any 55 inch, 60 inch TVs that were fully covered in color like that in store. And so it was cool to be almost like a catalyst to big box retailers kind of creating packaging at that size, at that color. And I remember one time walking into Costco and seeing they always have this stack out, you know, above all the extra, all the extra products and walking in the store and they had all these cool TVs everywhere. But then up in the background was like almost 50 to a hundred Vizio TV boxes, just free advertising everywhere for like all this cool stuff we had done. And that was a really cool moment. Uh, for me, it was about like creating that purple cow in the, in the market, right? Something Seth Godin really creates something remarkable and memorable. And that's really what we did. And that, that to me, like, you know, again, it was the first time leaving out and doing magnetic on my own and starting this company. It was something that said like, Hey, we're ready for this. Like I, I didn't know, you know, you know, you have to test yourself. And yeah. that Vizio story really proved to me that, look, you know, you have to think that way. You've got to really uh, tackle problems from that direction. And, uh, you know, I mean, honestly, a cool story just came out this week. Vizio just sold to Walmart for, you know, close to $3 billion. So yeah, listen, that's that. pretty awesome to see that. And, you know, know that we were a part of that story and, uh, and help them get there because not all brands can do that. You know, you took a, a, a relatively, you know, a, you know, Chinese manufacturing brand that was built in, you know, Costa Mesa, California, or up in Orange County. 
and it was designed there and we brought it to market and people thought for a long time that it was a Sony brand that they launched underneath Sony. And then what a huge compliment that was to build the brand that was competing with something like that. And it just reminded me one thing that I, I remember talking to William about and we were talking about who we compete against. And I said, a lot of brands, I think, struggle with this is they said, well, you know, look, we, we're competing with Maxent and these Toshiba and these low end TVs. I said, if you're a TV, you are competing with Sony and Samsung and all the big boys. It doesn't matter. You know, you're a TV. And so it changed the mentality of how we approached it. But it was about making waves, standing out, making a difference. And again, delivering that concept of where vision meets value, where, where everybody should have high quality products for a decent price. And uh, I don't know, it really set the stage for where we were going as a business too, uh, as Magnetic. So, um, you know, we, we learned a lot during that phase and what it did it it took us from originally just being really coming from the ethos of a brand design company or a design shop uh you know focused on creative and all that to building strategy and understanding that the strategy in equals great creative out uh we sl slowly added more things as thing i mean come on I'm, I'm old we're old i you know look when we did that there was no social media we were building social media as it yeah. happened right so that's the crazy part to me like twitter what's twitter launched <laughs> twitter what launched in the thing, middle of Matt, that right you got twitter <laughs> what are we doing this what's this thing called yeah. and anyway i felt like vince vaughn when he's you know talking about like yeah what are we going to be we twatting about around over here, you know, nobody, knows, nobody, nobody was or how it was going to work. But anyway, I think learning those along the way. And then we, we added in components as we started to see the value. Content creation became a big one, video, photography, all the assets we needed to create. So we realized that we've got a great, we, we have quality creative design. We know what we're doing there. If we have the right strategy and we can build the right creative assets, if we have the right creative assets and vision, we can build out all the content that goes with it. And the missing piece was in the last few years was adding that really the growth and digital side, um, you know, taking that and saying, look, it's really now about more than anything conversion into sale. And a lot of problems that we see with uh, brands and agencies alike is they'll take you to a certain point on the cliff and then they say, well, good luck. And we realize, like, look, that's not where we're at. We have to finish it. We have to close the loop. And uh, that sales part is really, again, probably to, to bring Brad into the call here, why we have a CRO at an agency to help us drive revenue for us and for our clients. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's a, kind of the story of where mags come from and our first big client with Vizio. That was 18 years just packed into three minutes. <laughs> yeah, no worries. I, I got a no few more deal. stories to go with that, but I mean, that'll be the starting point. Yeah, sure. history yeah. lesson. <laughs> Yeah, that's rad. So Brad, your, your background, obviously you've got what a, a decade and a half in, in the CPG market or consumer goods market. Um, tell us some of the, the changes that you've seen in the market and kind of where you see things uh, currently with the, with the market and where you see things going. Yeah, it's uh, it's a pretty crazy time to be, I mean, I'd say in, in any market, but in consumer goods in particular, you know, you think about the days of the, the Walmart five and dime and how simple it was. You put a product on a shelf at a good price and somebody walks in, they see it and they, the value is established and they grab it and put it in their cart and leave. And now with how competitive the market is, I mean, that's something I think in the last 15 years that hasn't changed is it's as competitive as ever. Um, hmm. Shelf space stays the same size. Uh, it doesn't get bigger. Um, so that's caused a lot of companies to have to adopt that digital shelf space and build direct to consumer types of programs, which has its own types of nuances and things that are just so much different than doing brick and mortar or a direct to retail types of business. Um, you know, I think a lot of things too, when you look at that digital transformation and I know here at mag, it's no shortage of us hearing the buzzword AI and what that can do for your business. And I think looking at how brands are personalizing their offering to customers at every single touch point, you know, with so many brands out there in a digital capacity, it's so important to have mm -hmm. a curated custom offering for who your target audience is and identifying them and hitting them as hard as you possibly can. But it's being relatable and being authentic. And now with all of these technological things that we're able to incorporate into marketing mixes, I think it's really exciting to see what level of personalization a lot of brands are able to bring to the table. Um, I think, you know, innovation and branding are some of those things that are important as ever. Um, but seeing that change from, you know, a decade and a half ago when I was sitting at Walmart meetings and the buyers would ask, you know, do you have a Facebook? Does your brand have a Facebook <laughs> now to where it's almost this thing where do you have at least a hundred thousand followers on TikTok, Instagram? What is your target market strategy? How are you merchandising on these platforms? How are you uh, taking that traffic on your website? Mm -hmm. How are you driving them? to our stores and our shelves and selling through and proving that. So a lot of things have changed. I think a lot of it's exciting. 
yeah. you know, one of the benefits of, of my role in an agency, which, you know, I think Dave said, it's, it's relatively rare to have a, a CRO at an advertising agency, but it allows me to sit in a fractional seat with so many different clients and so many brands within consumer goods and act as that full holistic person that helps them know what's the personalized marketing strategy. How does that impact price and value at the point of sale? And then what does it mean to truly create an advocacy program for a lot of those brands? And it's a ton of fun, um, but lots of changes and lots of stuff. I think we've got to keep our, ourselves abreast of uh, with the, the ever-changing technological climate. Yeah, for sure. And your one of your one of your success stories from uh, uh, past life is uh, Skinny Bunny Tea, right? No, skinny... we did Skinny Girl Vodka skinny girl. and Margaritas. Yeah, you drank those, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah Matt, I think that started my. Morning I just saw you move. Too. I thought, yeah, I saw you move <laughs> some off the shelf behind you. Yeah, Matt, that's actually a, a really good example of defining exactly who your target audience is and building a product to help fit that void and. You know, I think a lot of times we talk about what is pull sell versus push sell and push sell is you create a product and you try to take it to market and push it into a retailer and push it into a customer's cart. Well, on the skinny girl side, there was a survey into the market. What are people looking for? And at the time it was low calorie alternatives to some of the more indulgent sides of life, which booze is probably one of the highest ways that you have calorie leakage in your diet and all that stuff. And Bethany and, and our team identified exactly what that gap was. And we went and we built an unbelievable product. It tasted great. I'll be honest, I drank a lot of it back in the day. I don't partake as much anymore, um, but it tasted great. And that was able to, to start a brand that then was able to parlay that into a lot of other different types of categories and eventually selling that, that uh, line of alcohol to Beam Suntory and it becoming part of the Jim Beam family. Um, but it's a, a prime example of identifying your audience and speaking to them and selling to them and the importance of brand and brand advocacy. And I think a, a lot of brands that are going to market now really quickly can learn from a story like that. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, one of the keys is that, you know, it's irresponsible to not use data and insights and analytics to determine your audience set, to determine what product people, I think a lot of times people, and we've seen it, right. And actually we've had turnarounds with companies where they come to us with a product a product brand that they're in store, they're in a retailer and they're like, well, we're, I mean, we're selling, but we just, you know, we're, we have, we're stuck, you know, we're at this plateau and it's that transformation between product to brand that really helps to bring them to life. Right. Um, we always talk about that idea of how do you become a household name? You know, it's that concept right. of putting br your brand in their hand and having this repeatable business that's something that they come back to, that creates community, that creates something more, something that you're, it's a badge of honor to either have that product, wear that product, use that product, share with others. You know, I think everybody's always looking for that next cool thing. And uh, I mean, some brands do it really well right out of the gate and some just don't. And I think that's the real true understanding here is you have to look in the mirror and say, where do we need to be in order to be that? And if you're, if you're, if you're flailing at all, <laughs> you're going to know it really quickly um, by your sales because like, you can sell anything for a little bit, right? There's a flash in the pan concept where price can get you out there. But if you don't build a brand to go with it, your, your shelf life is going to be you know limited. So. Yeah. And it's funny. We, we, Oh, I was going to say, there's just another story too, that I think back on from the past of, we brought to market, uh, Jack Daniels, um, their entire licensing beef line. And when we went to market, we were the highest priced item by about 33% in the category. And a lot of people thought we were crazy on the price, but with the premium brand, the way that they've established themselves in the market, it sold and continues to sell to this day. I think it's been at market now for 12 years. It's a category captain at Walmart and Sam's club. But when you have that brand and you have the messaging and the audience knows that if you're putting out a product that it has that name brand on it, it's going to be premium. It's going to be worth it. Mm. Then you can overcome some of those initial hurdles and you don't have to become a flash in the pan and, and you can build a sustainable business. So I look yeah. at those as just two pretty exciting examples that even though they were, they were, you know, a decade ago, a little more, there's still things that brands today, I think over overlook and a lot of stuff that they can learn from. Yeah. What are, what are for both of you, what are a couple of like, early stage um, actions that brands can take, um, you know, anyone listening to this that might have a, a consumer goods company that's like, man, this is resonating. What are some of the first few actions that you can take as a business to start building that legacy that you're talking about? Yeah, I would say the first thing I always recommend, especially if you're questioning certain things, is to do like a survey around your audience type, right? So a lot of times what we'll do is we'll say, all right, 
uh, where do we want to grow? What, what audience do we currently have? Let's talk to them. So we'll understand who we think they think we are, that we're already buying our product. Secondary is really looking outside of that to say, who is our target audience? Let's run a survey directed at them and ask them questions, make sure we're positioned correctly, that we're saying the right things. Do they like our marketing? Are they resonating with the messaging that we have? Um, are we, you know, is the product right for them at the right time? And does it make sense, right? Because I think a lot of times you have to ask yourself the sweet spot, which is to me is, what do you believe is in inherently true about yourself and your product? What does, what are the competitors saying and doing? And then what does the consumer want? You know, in the end, if you find the balance between those, how are we different? What's our unique selling proposition in the market and what do consumers want? If you find that little, you know, spot, that's your sweet spot. That's where you can own a uh, space in people's hearts, minds. And ultimately, if you have a share of heart and mind, you get a share of wallet. That's when they decide to make a purchase. Yeah. And so I always say the first thing to do is like literally strip down, like, you know, get naked in front of the mirror, like take a look at yourself as a brand and say, where are my flaws? Where are my faults? Where can I get better? And then work at it. That's the first thing I definitely would suggest. Yeah, that's a really good suggestion. And I'll keep mine short and sweet. You know, we're living in a day of age where there's an abundance of data all around us. And if you're not utilizing that data to help make decisions on product innovation, customer insight strategy, your hiring roadmap for your business, you're falling behind. And it's really easy to access that data. Um, so anybody that's out there trying to do it, that's the first place I would go is try to find out where that data lives and build a story from the data. Yeah. And I think one other thing I'll add, and I think using the data, using the insights, using the surveys, the most important thing when you're putting your brand out there is to do it right. You know, you really sometimes you only have one shot right? You, you have to deliver on your product. You have to make sure you it says and does what it's supposed to do. Because if you don't, there's lots of other brands out there people can choose from, right? And so that's really important. And the second part of it is, is it, it's, you know, you, you can't just spray and pray this idea out there. It's got to be like a sniper approach. Like we really got to know who we're trying to target, right place, right time, right message, right product. There is no guessing anymore. That's a very expensive endeavor to just take a guess and start spraying stuff out there. I think it's got to be pinpointed. It's got to be hyper targeted. And if you're not doing that, you're you're just you're just wasting money. All super good suggestions. Yeah, I think Brad, just to to add on to the data and Dave, what you're saying, like. Um, there's a lot of people that I'll see that um, they hear the the data. Um, terminology they know that there's so much sometimes there's a there's a case of like data paralysis um, and a lot of people get locked up in that mode of oh my gosh i've got data coming in from my marketing team from my sales team from my <laughs> my uh, yeah. you know cs team um yeah. and all over the place and then you know add financials onto that trying to make that into a beautiful storyline that actually helps you start taking those first steps i think that's one of the harder things to do but um also one of those things that's critical in building the legacy brand that everybody's looking to do. Yeah. yeah you, totally it's how do you, how do you interpret the data? Right. I think that's the biggest thing people miss. Data is just data unless you figure out how to audit it, understand it, interpolate it into something that you can you know, make real. And I think that's the challenge, right? Uh, analysis by paralysis, you can keep going and going. But I think one of the things we've built out and it's something we focus on that brand growth process that we have is there's super, there's like specific inputs and outputs. And as long as we have those, we're able to articulate a story out of it. And if you, if you have those like pinpoint pinpointed in your business, then you can focus on what points are interesting, not like, oh, I don't know where to start. I think that's the key is having a plan of set a, set aside, what are you trying to accomplish out of this? And then use the data points to prove it out, not take all this data in and figure out what to do with it. You have to know what you're trying to do with it before you take it in. Love it. Love it. So give me, give me, let's, let's close this off with a few um, insights. Where do you guys see the consumer goods market um, CPG going in the next two to five years? What are you guys seeing right now based on boots on the ground, um, real time info that's coming in? What are some of the trends? What are the, some of the things to look out for? Um, Want to leave people with some action that they can take to, you know, their, their budgets as they're uh, starting to prepare for the rest of the year here in 24 and again into 25 and 26. Where, Brad, you want to say it? Yeah, I think one of the first things is making sure to embrace technology. There's so many things out there that having somebody in your organization that can help build a logical technological roadmap 
uh, is pretty important. I think a hyper focus on personalization, a hyper focus on your direct to consumer strategy, as that's going to impact the metrics you're able to provide when you're going to a retailer. Um, and then I think just not forgetting about your competition. Uh, there's a lot of people out there, a lot of different brands, and don't lose sight of what they're doing and the innovation that they're bringing to market because the moment you fall behind, it becomes really tough to, to catch up. Uh, absolutely. I, I think competitive or just predictive type analytics around like what is going on, what are the consumers wanting just like this? Well, let's go look and see what's coming, not, you know, not what's happening or what has happened. You always got to be looking into the future on, on those things. I think also, you know, Brad, you mentioned it like that customer experience is everything. Like, uh, you know, it's so much more an extension of your brand than you even know that it is your brand, right? I mean, how customer services, how the, you know, the response to something, you know, again, you had a problem with the product or you're trying to, that, that interaction that you get there is so critical. An app that's built connected to a product that you may have, um, you know, all of that stuff matters. How does your product function? You know, it creates my sentiment around a brand, right? So if it's all good and even the way that it ships and the kind of information I get in my inbox, that connected experience that makes me feel like I, I, I'm being taken care of. That's what keeps people in the loop as a, as a brand. They feel like you care about them, you know, and it can be automated, right? It doesn't even have to be like, it's so personalized, but it should feel like it. I think, you know, one of the things uh, in one of the blogs I wrote not too long ago talks about like this whole personalization, like you should know my name, what kind of coffee I like and how I like my cream and sugar, right? That's kind of the expectation these days. It's not a, a nice to have, it's an expectation by consumers out there. And so I think it's really important to really, really know your consumer at your audience specifically, what you need to do uh, to make them feel loved, right? And I think brands that do that well, I mean, just look, like Yeti, look how Yeti's done, right? With their brand. You're walking in, yeah. you're buying a premium product. I just walked into the Yeti store yesterday, like, you know, they've got these new colors, but you know, you're talking, you know, 299 and plus type products that people are buying like no, nobody's business. They don't care um, because they're great products and they've done a great job positioning themselves. They know the audience, they know who they're targeting. Um, so I think it's really just just making sure that you have that connection point. And if you do that well, and you, and you build on it, right. And if, if things change, change with it, be adaptive as you go. Those are the most critical things you can do as a, as a product company. Don't set yourself in stone and think this is the way it has to be forever. Adapt and, and modify your plan as you see the market change. And as, as the product changes, as consumers habits and buying trends change, work with them, understand them. I think it's so important. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I always think back to, you know, so many people, um, businesses, large and small, um, will spend so much time on the acquisition of new customers and um, a lot of times forget the follow through. And when so many people are, you know, um, edging for cost of acquisition and, uh, you know, price per click, um, return on ad spend, all of these things, um, there's so much impact to be made on the follow through after the transaction mm -hmm. is done, um, getting into the lifetime value of your customers and getting into repeat purchase and getting into word of word of mouth. Um, it's a, it's a huge, huge, huge world in the marketing ecosystem right now. Um, and it's exciting too, right? Yeah, it is. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, I think we talked about earlier, you know, Matt, you asked about Vizio and all that stuff. I think one of the things on our journey was we kind of launched with Vizio consumer goods brand or a consumer, you know, uh, consumer electronics brand. And we loved that connection. We took that and we used our process to build out. We worked in enterprise, we worked in software, we worked in tech, we worked in, you know, healthcare. We did all those things. And what we did is we learned that there's a lot of consistencies in it, like how you build brands and what you do and, and just audiences are different. And if there was a point where we said, Hey, we're agnostic to who we work with. But what we found is that what we love and what we do the best is really consumer brands because of this reason, because we really do care deeply about this interaction between a, a customer and a product. And it's our ethos, it's our heritage, it's where we came from and it's where we're focused now. So as we've continued to niche back down to that, it just, it, and our focus is really around how do we make this the best interaction we can for consumer brands in consumers' hands. For sure, that's great. Right on. Well, I, I really appreciate the time today, gentlemen. Um, been rad talking to you guys. Um, looking you forward too. to doing this again and getting down into some tactical conversations around consumer goods brands and uh, some of the, the current trends in the marketing and the sales and um, 
in the whole world. So I appreciate you both. Uh, we'll be tuning in again in the next week here for another Stoke session. Yeah, buddy. All right. Thank thanks, man. Appreciate it, Brad. See you guys. <laughs> Later, guys. Thank you.